Hey everybody, it's Rhett with you again. We're going to be entering into my second term of my presidency in Democracy 3. Again, we have Ghost Rider with us working as my chief of staff. Ghost Rider, thank you for coming along for the ride, buddy. It is my uh, pleasure, Mr. President. And uh, thank you for keeping my head off the chopping block as long as you have so far. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Last episode, we ran the election. Uh, everything in the country is pointing in the right direction. We've turned the ship. We're paying down the national debt. We have a surplus in the budget, and we're enacting policies. As a matter of fact, a lot of the policies we enacted in the last episode were all environmental policies uh, to kind of kind of keep my head because the people that tried to assassinate me were uh, environmentalists. So. What do you say we get into it and talk about this power lines policy question that we've got going on? Very good. What's up? All righty. So uh, people are proposing power lines. Uh, angry citizens are protesting against a power a project to build power lines through their villages. These power lines are nece necessary to further increase use of renewable energy sources. Not building them would be an economic setback. But if you ignore the citizens, this will make them even angrier and supportive of their cause. Build the power lines anyway. Option A. Nobody wants power lines next to their houses, but they have to be built somewhere. And until recently, these people have been demanding more clean energy. The power lines will be built. Or B. Stop construction. There are alternative ways to explore, like underground power lines, and there are claims that the health of those living near power lines may be in danger. It is better to be safe than sorry. And uh, I hate to bring up kind of a, a chick flick movie, but this is kind of kind of Aaron Brockovich type territory, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, hers was uh, more nuclear power, but yes, yeah, this is still um, a concern. Uh, a lot of people have a concern that there could be uh, health effects by living near the uh, the power lines. Well, and what what's really thrown me for a loop and uh, making it hard for me to determine and decide is that this is for renewable energy sources uh, in the the description, which is environmentalists seem to be wanting this, but citizens aren't environmentalists are unhappy with me but i need citizen well I, it's one of those really really gray areas but i'm erring on the side of this not make eyesores we've got enough ribbon across america that's concrete and, and asphalt that you know power lines next to roads and stuff like that instead of through neighborhoods or even like they said underground power lines through urban areas you don't see power lines uh, in New York City like you do in the small town that I live in. You know, the power poles are in every corner. Right, kind of and, and I happen to live uh, near s several uh, high-tension, the big, huge, monstrous uh, towers that carry uh, seven or eight lines each um, that go up through mm -hmm. the mountains and everything else. And I'm sure that running those underground uh, would be maybe more expensive, uh, but... They certainly uh, are are an eyesore, uh, and and you know this could be feeding power from say a new solar energy area or a new wind farm, um, you know that everybody wanted the wind farm, but now when it comes time to to carry the power uh, to the main grid, uh, they don't want the the power lines. Um, yeah, I, I tend to lean with you that especially if. The underground power lines can be done, and it's not uh, a significant, you know, uh, economic. Cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, I think that's the better way to go. You know, for the long term of the country. Well, then we'll go ahead and select that one and get right back into other stuff that we've got going on. Actually, I'm going to go back to that for a second. Uh, unemployment is dropping. Crime is pretty much non-existent. And it, oh, the economy is still in the tank. Uh, let's take yeah, a look the global at that GDP. The good news is mm. our, our surplus is 253 billion this quarter. That's up from 88 last quarter. So 
uh, our revenue programs are working. Right. I was actually trying to find a measure of uh, where... And this may be a good time to take a look at our cabinet. We haven't looked at that. And we've got this person here. Oh, yeah. That was wanting to bail on us. Something fierce. This guy, a religious capitalist. Religion isn't really a thing in this administration. Right. At least in the game. Again, this is a game, not the real runt. But do I want to fire a guy which will lower everybody's loyalty? Or do I just want to reshuffle people in their positions that doesn't affect their loyalty. Um, mm, it costs 10 capital to reshuffle and pick seven new cabinet members. Or if I fire one, I hinder all of them and get to basically put a new guy in the tax place. Or do I want to see if his capitalist tendencies are no, No, motorist and liberal. So... Yeah, you know, the liberal is good, but obviously he's he's uh, disaffected. He, uh, you know, is asking, basically asking to be out. I don't know uh, what we could do different to, you know, if motorists, we'd have to do something to, you know, do more with, with private autos and we're going the other direction. So, um, and it's only two capital to get rid of that individual. Yeah. But like I said, it's going to, we're going to do that. We're going to can him and everybody else kind of took a hit loyalty wise. Yeah. Uh, that's all right. Not much. Let's look for yeah, a much. new tax person, trade unionists and socialists. No. Uh, conservatives. No tax ethnic minorities and conservatives. Uh -huh. Um, it's a possibility. Uh, liberal and ethnic minorities with no experience. And low loyalty. Environmentalist and liberal. That's our guy right there. Because we're going to do a lot of stuff to bring yeah. uh, those two groups into play in this term. So I'm going to hire that guy in his place and call it good. So we've got 18 political capital. And one of the things I didn't get done on the first term that I want to do is I want to go ahead and do that smart meter program, which is going to be under uh, public welfare. No. No. No, it's under economy, I think. There it is. Yeah. Yep. We're, Four up in the white. Right there. Okay, gotcha. Yep. I found it. it. Takes eight quarters to implement, so we'll we won't see the full effect of this till basically I've got two years left. But it's we're kicking it in, and we're gonna bring it up. Energy efficiency, environmentalists, envir environmentalist membership. We're listening. We're just you know running out of power to get things done. Okay. Uh, now. We're again because we, you know, brought in food stamps and we basically got welfare systems and stuff like that. This is going to be a major policy that I want to get into for uh, making middle earnings feel much better about what's going on. Oh, the middle class. Try and, to, uh, yeah, try to get. Yeah, they were. Everybody, they were the it. ones that uh, um, were struggling the most. Really took, yeah, you know, took the brunt of the policy changes that we made. Yep. And uh, again, like I said in those videos, was you know the middle class is the largest demographic, so uh, they're the ones that just by sheer size feel the burden the most. And what I was wanting to do is I was wanting to get this enacted, but I can't. So let's see, law and order can't do anything there. Um. Mm -mm -mm. But I wonder. I can do this. Uh, we're going to enable private institutions to move forward and help us with our, our penal system. And it's basically going to completely wipe out uh, our, our crime rate. Uh, we're going to live in a utopia as far as crime goes. 
So you see crime takes a major hit. Liberals love it. Conservatives love it. Unemployment actually gets attacked, which is happy for me. Capitalists level it, level it, uh, and trade unionists hate it. Yeah, because you know a that, lot of the prisons are unionized under the state, uh, under the various states and the federal. So, yeah, this would be uh, this is a good uh, well, capitalist move. We're going to improve our efficiency and uh, uh, be able to manage uh, to outcomes in a better way. So that's why we'll see the crime right. continue to go down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I think this actually follows suit with what we enacted in the state funded prisons was well not necessarily state funded but uh state mandated programs right of you know rehabilitation and training and such like that so we'll go ahead and do that one yeah we're going to confirm spending the political capital and i want to look into health as a, a little bit of a problem uh the national health again is meh. yeah uh so we can do a compulsory school sports. All your kids will participate in sports. However, they're not entitled to an award for just showing up. <laughs> um, uh, I don't so. know what you remember, but when I was in uh, the middle grades, uh, it was compulsory. There was a national sports program. There were awards. Oh, yeah. Um, they're, they're, but, I mean, you had to win them. You didn't just get them. Um and well, yeah, everyone you was had required. to meet certain criteria. Yep. Yeah, you had to meet certain criteria. There was a, a thing about, you know, physical education, president's excellence or whatever. Exactly. Uh, I remember it during uh, the back end of Reagan to Bush era was a thing, uh, before Clinton even. So yep. we'll kick that in. And I don't really think that we've got... Um, Let's see. I'm going to say we save our uh, political capital and move into the second turn or second quarter, excuse me, second quarter of this year and go forward from there. So see how the, the changes that we've done turning a blind eye to corporate tax avoidance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm just hoping the global wow. GDP comes back. The global economy. Nope. Yeah. Not tell yet. me about it. I, I wish. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's an urgent policy question that requires your immediate attention. Global economy is in a deep recession and our GDP is severely reduced as a result. Well, our GDP may be reduced, but it's still more powerful than when we took office. Definitely. So we, uh, but that GDP hit that we're taking is really getting into our surplus, but our surplus, it, it, it's still there and it's a significant surplus. We may not be paying down the national debt at, you know, record breaking pace, but, uh, we're paying it down still. So let's see. Policy question of software patents. Uh, software patents are a form of intellectual property law that allows companies to protect algorithms, pieces of computer code that implement a new technology, such as new type, uh, a new type of translation software or a system for purchasing online. They're generally popular with big business, but unpopular with those who fight for a free, quote, internet. And those who think that patents are far too general and stifle innovation. A, we either allow the software patents. Uh, it's essential for our digital economy that we enact laws to encourage investment in new products and technologies. Without allowing software patents, we will be opening the doors to small companies, including those from overseas, to step in and reap the benefits of large, expensive investments made by our technology firms. Nobody will invest in technology here without this kind of protection. Or B, we reject the software patents. Software patents sound reasonable until you realize they could be used to stifle competition and innovation. Few of these ideas being patent patented are truly original discoveries, but simply a land grab by lawmakers to patent the obvious and ensure a virtual monopoly to the tech firms with the most lawyers. This is nothing but big business protectionism. 
Now, here's my thing. Uh, as a content creator on YouTube, I've had a couple copyright infringements, and people have, and I've actually talked to you about it. Somebody has been out there stealing my videos, so to speak, actually downloaded them, re-uploaded them under their account, uh, but it was it wasn't a very good job. I think it was uh, more of a bot kind of thing, but it kind of makes me leery of not allowing for those patents because uh, IP, it doesn't matter where it comes from. IP is still IP. You can patent IP. So that by allowing the software patents, that just furthers intellectual property law. But you're the one with the MBA. I'm just an average, <laughs> average idiot. So. Well, no, I, th I think you said it well. I mean, you, we're, it's often said that we live in the information age. And, and if you think about it, inventions in factories, the inventions of, of mechanical devices, whether it was trains, automobiles, whatever, um, you know, drove the industrial age. And those things are all patented because, you know, they all led to products that uh, led to the industrial age, uh, software are the products, uh, you know, sure there's hardware as well, but software is a product in the information age and products, uh, you need to be able to protect the investment in developing products. So, uh, you know, I think patents are the way to go. Okay. So we're both in, you know, we're both in agreement yep. that we're going to allow software patents. Fantastic. Let's go on into the rest of what's going on in year two. So what I wanted to do last time, but I ran out of political power because I didn't have much to start with, is we're going to implement a new policy and it's going to be under welfare and it's going to be compulsory work for the unemployed. The poor are absolutely going to hate it. 100%. And I kind of believe in this. You know, okay, we're willing to help you but you need to be proving that you're willing to help yourself in the meantime. So it, it goes along, and it, I think, and I, I may be way wrong on this, but it was Bill Clinton that initially yep. uh, did the thing where you have to go and show that you at least put in two applications or whatever a week if you were getting unemployment benefits. So it's this kind of goes along with that. And uh, well, and Clinton did a lot I, with I, the reducing the the welfare by um, this this kind of a program, and and it was very successful. So, and realistically, middle income, this is going to be their payback for, you know, for dealing with us as long and the the hurt that we put on them. Right. So we're all if you're unemployed then this is this is what you got this is the hoops that you've got to jump through to get your check every week right so that and it doesn't cost us a whole lot and it really kind of middle class start coming back to us and it really hits unemployment because people are like oh man it's either I go get a job or I work for the state and make peanuts so uh, <laughs> yep oh man that was expensive political capital wise yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Let's see. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to do much anything else, but I'm going to try. Uh, and it's going to get into here. I can't do anything there. Uh, let's see. No, that's not it. That's my <laughs> achievements that I've gotten while I've been playing this game, practicing for oh, this. Oh, okay. Uh, nothing. Is there anything we can do in the tax area with... Um, There's nothing we can do in the tax area right now. All of that as is... As far as relief? Yeah, no? Okay. Because uh, we are still in, running a, a nice uh, a nice surplus. We're running a nice... Yeah, but I've got a bunch of... A bunch of other plans. Maybe we'll look into lowering taxes and stuff like that to reaffirm and make that uh, our party candidate get a third term, which is mm. really unheard of in our system. Right. right. What the last one was Reagan, Reagan, Bush. Right. You know, yep. uh, the the three terms of the same party. Um, I 
Hmm. Really nothing we can do much that's going to help anything. So we're going to save a couple political capital and go into... We may look at doing that when we have the debt paid down to a point that we have now a surplus of... Or a, a mm -hmm. I guess, a, a, a better standing there. Either a nil deficit or I mean, we've paid down two thirds of the national debt. So, right. well, we're still we're running with a ninety-five percent approval. So, mm -hmm. and just went up to ninety-seven. So, right, that's all good. Credit crunch. A worldwide squeeze on the availability of credit caused by concerns about economic viability of several governments has resulted in massive spikes in interest rates being demanded by the bond market to finance government debt. This is likely to cause us severe financial issues if we are running a high debt or deficit. Mr. President, the country is going to thank you for getting our debt down because um, <laughs> we would have been buried under the interest. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's why one of the first things I wanted to do was start tackling that. Yep. Uh, well, that's fantastic. And the the global economic forecast is still in the poo. Um, but our GDP, we're getting more of... Basically, the entire world is latching onto the American economy and saying, you know, throw us a lifeline. Right. So our health is going up. Our education is still pretty high. Poverty is actually down in the green now. Yep. Uh, unemployment, I want to do something to keep stemming that, but... Uh, we've got 97% of the vote. Woohoo. We've got 26 political capital. Um, hmm. We've got an $885 billion debt. That's fine. Completely happy with that. Um, and let's see. I'm going to try to do... Uh, I'm going to do something for legal aid and stuff with, uh, I think. No, it's over here. Now I remember it. Jury trial. Right mm. here. Okay. And this is going to, it doesn't cost us a whole lot as far as political power to raise it. Mm-hmm. Lowering it takes a, a significant bit, but liberals love it. And what it does is, you know what, everybody, and this is one of the founding principles we have. You, if you are, you know, charged with a crime, you have the capability, regardless of what crime it is, you can ask for a trial by jury, by a jury of your peers. Yep. Uh, so this is universal across the board, you know, blue, purple, yellow, whatever your color, male, female, whatever your sex may be. Everybody has that right. It's an unalienable right. So we're going to go ahead and reaffirm that policy. And we're also going to make it, uh, which I couldn't see this happening in the real world so much, but um, I could see, because there are people out there uh basically larger firms that will say, yeah, come in and we'll give you a free consultation. Mm. Uh, but that's about it. They'll give you an hour's worth of consultation uh, for legal advice. And uh, what I want to do is I want to make that a little bit more available to everybody across the board uh, to, you know, be able to talk to an attorney, uh, be able to talk to somebody. Hey, I have a question about this, you know, can can this person do that or can I do that, you know, this to that person kind of thing? Um, well, in this, in just, uh, a lot of people are forced to to go with a public defender. And, of course, in, in our current world, those people are very overworked and they, you know, um, can only give a little bit of time to each. If we improve the funding and the programs around that, uh, those that can't afford uh, their own defense, um, maybe you can have a higher quality defense. Uh, you, we do know that uh, if you look at uh, the folks that have been, uh, you know, their, their convictions overturned with DNA evidence, you know, that came to light, a lot of them were the 
or we're under public defenders. So, uh, you know, this this again goes in with the jury trial. It, it helps to make sure everybody has a fair a fair shot. So we are going to confirm that we still have a decent amount of political capital. And I want to look into a couple other things. I know we don't have enough to do one of the things I wanted to do. Uh, th and this is tur uh, yeah, this is the third turn of this year. So um, I'm going to economy um, no, no public services maybe. No. Where is it? Where is it? That's not it. Yep, I can't do the one I wanted to do there. Um, I saw free parenting classes in there. I think we yeah, free, you had mentioned that. Yeah, uh, let's try to bring that one in. We're still going to have eight political capital when this is done. And this will, you know, this is one of those things that the parents uh, that were kind of left out in the cold uh, in the first term that we're going to, hey, you know what? We're going to help you. If you decide to be a parent, uh, because obviously the parent membership goes up and parents overall like it. So uh, that's fine. We're yep. going to go ahead and do that. And let's see. I think I've got enough for one more uh, policy. And then we're going to save what we've got and move into the next next quarter of my first term and go into... Compulsory foreign languages. This make ourselves a beings economically. We are the the world power, uh, and we've we've solidified that by the rest of the the world's economies taking a dump, and ours you know holding strong at least running on a, a surplus. Uh, we're going to, you know what, we're going to bring in where. And this is the thing. When I was in high school, I don't know about when you were because it was a few years before my time. I had to take a minimum of two semesters of a foreign language. Um, and then when I went to college, I had to take uh, a couple semesters of a foreign language. So, uh, and it, there was no way getting around it. Yeah. Personally, I think it makes you a more well-rounded person. But... Uh, well, absolutely. And if you look at the U.S., we're one of the very few countries that don't uh, graduate people that have are bilingual. You know, many most other countries uh, that aren't English speaking do try to teach English uh, so that, uh, you know, they're they're. Um, their folks can work on the, uh, the international economy and we need to be able to do the same thing, whether it's Spanish, French, uh, whatever. Um, you know, it improves our ability to uh, and understand and interact with others. And that's not just two semesters. Two semesters, basically, you can count to 10 and, and uh, you know, know the colors. Right. Uh, it, it, it will be enough that where people can uh, can communicate. Well, and, and I will have to say that, you know, I, I took my classes. Uh, I did sufficient enough in my classes uh, I did better in college than I did in high school because I was a little more engaged in college because I waited until I was much older to go to college um, where I understood the necessity. Uh, but I will have to say, as far as foreign language goes, the best way to learn a foreign language is total immersion. Um, when, when I lived in Korea for a year, uh, having to communicate either through sign language or or pictograph or whatever, as well as kind of some broken language that they would pick up on, that I would pick up on, uh, was, I, I picked, you either picked it up quick or you kind of got left out in a cold. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> so, definitely. So we're going to go ahead and enact that and we're going to roll right into the fourth quarter of year one of my second term year five of the print the, the, yeah, yeah uh easy for you to say yeah. mr president absolutely uh who who elected porky pig um, <laughs> and here we go a appointing friends to top jobs ghostwriter that's how you got chief of staff uh. but <laughs> 
Alrighty, so our GDP is again still on the rise. Uh, it's fantastic. Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, everything else is, you know, I like green. Green is good. Yeah. Uh, we've got a we've got a policy question that we've got to come up with. Economic forecast. The global economy is still in the tank. Uh, 98% of the vote, we're, we're doing good. And our surplus, we've got another huge surplus uh, from policies we've enacted. Uh, like I said, maybe at the end of next year, we'll, we'll investigate the reduction of income tax and stuff like that. Well, if we run so, $200 billion surpluses, we'll be pretty close to eliminating the deficit by the end of next year. So, I mean, eliminating the debt, the debt. I used the wrong word, eliminating the debt by next year. <laughs> and you were the pointed, the one that pointed that yeah, out. Yeah, I, I gave the before. lecture That's... and then I uh, screwed it up. So, <laughs> yep. All righty. So let's see about extraditing this fella. A Middle East country with which we have no formal extradition treaty has requested that we extra extradite an immigrant living here to them to face charges of terrorism. They accuse him of being responsible for car bombings in their capital city. But the only evidence they have of this is the confessions of other terror suspects which may have been made under duress, quote, we can A, either extradite this guy, we should send this terrorist back to his home country immediately. There may be some minor concerns about the justice system in his home country, but they are fighting terrorists. And if the situation were reversed, we would be outraged at any refusal to send terrorists to face trial. This is no time to be squeamish about interrogation methods. Or B, Keep him here. If we extradite, extradite this man, there is a chance he will face the death penalty. We have no way of knowing if he will get a fair trial, and we cannot be sure that he is the right man. We cannot extradite people just on the say-so of foreign governments. We need to see evidence of criminal activity before we possibly send a man to his death. All right. Do you want to go first on this, or do you want me to go first? <sighs> you go first. Okay, here's the thing. I firmly believe that if America were to ask another country, we suspect we s suspect this person for X crime, and here's the proof that we have. Okay, be it you know whatever a confession or however, I would expect them to honor our wish and to honor for that to happen we need to honor their wish it's almost like okay not so much of a quid pro quo thing but if you did reverse the roles and i'm personally i'm not worried about death penalty i firmly believe there are people that do not need to be here uh because they are just not fit um however the other half of this is if if he's an immigrant, A, that means he's not a citizen. He's not protected under our laws of the Constitution. So if he's not a citizen here, then really, unless he asks for asylum, there's we don't have a leg to stand on personally. Yeah, um, I, I, and again, and and at uh, the face of it, I agree with you, and and, and I'm I'm going to go with that selection. A couple things uh, that that give me a little. Well, the first one is even though he's not a citizen, if he's in the United States, he's he's under the protection of the law. Um, and that's where we get a little squishy here because we don't have a formal extradition treaty. In other words, if uh, if we said, hey, we need so-and-so sent back, um, since we don't have the treaty, they may say, sorry, we're not going to do it. Um, but be that as it may, this is a case where... Um, you know, a, a foreign country, a, a power has come to us and said, you know, for these reasons, uh, we believe this person should stay in charges. And 
uh, you know, we want him sent back. Uh, he is not a full citizen. He, you know, he's here as an immigrant. I think the key is what you said, asylum. If he had come here and, and requested asylum when he arrived, uh, this would be a different story. But uh, he didn't do so. Um, and to only request asylum after you're, um, you know, you've been a request to extradite is kind of uh, backwards. So I, I support your decision in this one. I think the the U.S. people, as in the majority of the U.S. people, will support it as well. So we'll go ahead and extradite him. Uh, and like I said, it, I look at it kind of like an olive branch. If we're willing to, when you say that we have somebody that you want, even though that we don't have paperwork on it, I'm hoping. And maybe it's just me being the, the ultimate optimist that if somebody was overseas and we said, give them back to us, that they would reciprocate. Oh, and if they don't, that's when you get into a, a an issue uh, like on uh, ABC actually has a, a new program called Designated Survivor. And I've gotten into watching it and it's it's enthralling. I, it's a fantastic program and they actually did something like this almost like a, a kind of a three-way deal and ended up the the new president of the united states in the the tv series kind of got burnt uh he got burnt by a double agent mm. <laughs> i'll just say yeah so well but but you, you've said um, it you know every relationship starts with a little bit of trust and it's got to go one way first so and and yeah um you know a person um, may be found guilty and they may uh, be formed on, you know, found to the justice of the country they came from. Um, I, I think that's the way the world works. Yeah, again, if he had requested asylum when he arrived, um, it'd be a different story. Correct. So we're going to go into this is, if I'm correct, the fourth quarter of this year. And we're going to get into the, one of the programs that I wanted to get into right away and we're going to go here and where is it rural development grants uh it takes a little bit of time for this to kick in it'll kick in about halfway through year three um and it's, oh wow that's oh, maybe we'll let's look at the other policy that i wanted to oh, do yeah and we may because see what i want to do is i want to stem a problem that I know happens in the game called urbanization, uh, where basically everybody flocks, it, just like during the Industrial Revolution, uh, everybody flocks to these giant hubs of culture and then leaves no place for farms to be, nobody left to do the farming. So by doing that, it is hugely detrimental to food production and, and all that other stuff. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take a preventive measure from that happening with this, or we go back and look at education, which is one of the things that I wanted to look into. Here is wherever it happens to be. It's down here somewhere. Um, state schools? Where is it? State schools. Yeah, that's it. And we can raise state schools to to a huge amount of money and finish off paying you know, basically we're going to be spending a lot of money and we're going from 90 billion dollars a quarter to 217 so we're spending what 127 ish uh, 130 billion dollars a quarter but our schools just we have now passed Japan in mathematics. So what do you think? Do you think that would be a good level or do you want to try to back it down some? Because uh, basically student laptops for every kid, I don't know about that all the way, but we could go to the top end of say modern textbooks and only raise it by 90 billion. Yeah, I mean, a cost of 184 billion a quarter. Even at, was that what it is for modern textbooks? 184. I mean, that pretty well, it, well soaks up our surplus. But it's going to take 12, 12, right, right, 12 quarters for that to kick in. So it'll kick in basically the first quarter of year four, right. or kick in fully. 
Um, and hopefully, uh, because we have the surplus to do this, that justifies the tax rate that we have. Right. And B, um, hopefully the economy pulls up globally right. uh, to where we can, you know, keep this level where it's at. I, I think modern textbooks, uh, we could actually even <laughs> drop that back some more. Yeah, and, and I think that okay. this, well, you know, you, had, you looked at the other one, the Rural Development Grants, or no, yeah. Um, I think this one is almost foundational to that one. You need the schools to be as strong as possible to help support uh, the rural development areas. So, you know, I think this, this giving this one priority makes sense, in my opinion. 120 to 184. Yeah. So let's put this one right in the middle on 150 billion a okay. quarter. Okay. It doesn't cut into our, our surplus as much, but still gives us good boosts all over the place because unemployment takes a huge hit again. Yep. Poverty actually goes down because we're teaching kids how to be better. So I, that's the one I'm going to go for and call it good. So, guys, I guess you're going to have to stick around to see what these policies affected and where we're at when you come back next week for year two of my second term of presidency. So, guys, until then, we'll see you later. Bye now.